Imagine yourself about six months ago, around midnight, September 15th, up on the hills above Thessalonica, say at the Acropolis or the castle, looking southeast. Near the waning gibbous moon in the stars of Phaicus, you'd see Saturn slowly rising above the horizon. A very serene, very unremarkable scene, seen many times before. But at Saturn, something very, very different was going on. The Cassini spacecraft, an emissary from Earth, was screaming over Saturn's North Pole. It had recently turned its antenna back to Earth to transmit its data that it had gathered over the last couple of days, but this time was very, very different. Cassini was on a collision course with the planet. It was going to skim into the Saturn's atmosphere and its velocity, its termination was inevitable. A one-way trip for the spacecraft. Let me take you back to Mission Control, September 15, 2015, about 5 a.m. in California. We just had transition to high rate mode, and uh, we are in the atmosphere. Radio signal still holding, 30 seconds. Spacecraft has just crossed 10 degrees north latitude, altitude 1,000 miles. Copy, thank you. Okay, we call loss of signal at 115546. Just heard the signal from the spacecraft is gone, and within the next 45 seconds, so will be the spacecraft. Cassini's mission ending September 15th after 13 years at Saturn. Back on Earth, we were both triumphant and somewhat somber as we said goodbye to our faithful explorer and, I must say, in some sense, old friend. Cassini's end of mission. The Cassini spacecraft terminated, ended in a fireball high above the clouds of Saturn. It was the final chapter of Cassini's investigations. 22 orbits between the rings and the planet ending in a fireball above Saturn. The Cassini flight team was able to use every last capability of the spacecraft and every last second of the mission to transmit data. Seven years earlier, they'd taken advantage of a breakthrough in astrodynamics, an astrodynamics breakthrough that allowed three things to happen. First of all, we could use all our fuel, every last kilogram exploring the system, because if we got to the right place at the right time, everything else would be taken care of for us. This mission design allowed the spacecraft a complete and, and ultimate disposition within, within Saturn. And I'll get to a little bit later about why that is important. And finally, this mission design would allow us to go into an unexplored region of Saturn. As I said, we spent 13 years there. We've been all over the place, but one place only we hadn't been, what, right between the rings and Saturn themselves, itself. 22 orbits into that gap and exploring places we'd never seen before. After the Voyagers went by Saturn in the early 80s, it became very, very clear that the world needed to go back. The Cassini, actually Cassini-Huygens mission was an international venture right from its very conception. It was proposed by a, kitty, a, a small team of international scientists. It was accepted by an international congress of planetary scientists and then implemented by three space agencies, 19 member nations, hundreds of international contractors, and thousands of scientists and engineers. It took 15 years for that consortium to get from concept to launch, and another seven years to get to Saturn. And all, Cassini spent more time in concept than it did in flight. The total system consisted of 18 instruments, 12 on the orbiter, six on the probe, and it was chartered with the Saturn system. First of all, the planet itself, a giant ball of hydrogen and helium swirling with storms and whose internal structure was fairly unknown. The beautiful, beautiful rings uh, who have first sighted by Galileo in 1610 and have been a mystery pretty much ever since. Voyager told us a lot about the rings but raised as many questions as answers. And as a matter of fact, we're still arguing about how old they are. The enigmatic moon Titan Titan is a moon of Saturn, but if it weren't, if it had not succumbed to get Saturn's gravitational pull, it would be a planet. Larger than Mercury, larger than our own moon, it is covered by a thick organic haze of nitrogen and hydrocarbons. 
And then finally, the retinue of, not finally, but the retinue of Saturn's satellites. Saturn has been busily collecting material from all over the solar system. Some of it, it's generated itself, some it's captured from the Kuiper belt. Jupiter helps a lot, it brings things in and Saturn picks them up. 62 of the most eclectic uh, combination of moons you're ever going to find. And we got up to an awful lot of them. And then finally, the intense magnetic and electric fields and dust that surround the planet. Let me just walk you through a few of the highlights of our discoveries in those 13 years before I get back to the grand finale. First of all, Saturn, uh, covered with lots of small storms, but Cassini was lucky and got a one in a lifetime, a one in a 30 year, I should say, so one, one in Cassini lifetime opportunity, the so-called 30 year storm, a monster storm that began in Saturn's upper latitudes, reached all the way down into the interior of the planet, pulled material out to the surface, and was churning. We were actually able to see some of the interior of the planet through this storm. It persisted for almost two years, and as it slowly wrapped its way around the planet, the head and the tail met, and within a few months, the storm collapsed. You can still see its heat signature today, but Saturn looks exactly like it did in that picture on, the, on your left. The North Pole of Saturn, a jet stream that has persisted for almost 40 years. And in the middle of it, a hurricane the size of France. The winds around the edge of that hurricane are going about 540 kilometers per second. And again, this has persisted. It is almost, uh, oh, by the way, that's not the real color. We've uh, done a little bit of enhancement there just to keep uh, uh, so some of the contrast. The rings are lettered A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And they're named in order of their discovery. But what we found, and Voyager saw this first, that these rings are not A, B, C, D. There's A, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And they keep on going. The rings are nothing but many, 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 many rings. Uh, and they just go and go and go. As the closer you look, the more resolution you get in the rings, and I'll get back to that in a minute. But here's where we show you one of our favorite, my favorite pictures, actually our favorites. Every 15 years, the sun comes right edge on to Saturn. And from Earth, the rings appear to disappear because they are not illuminated. But from Saturn's point of view, you can look down over the top. Now, you've probably all seen photographs of the pyramids. At noon, you can barely see them, but at sunset, they cast these long shadows across the desert floor. This is what you're looking at here. Those shadows are the shadows of big clumps in the rings, cast over the much smaller material. Most of the rings are only a few, maybe 100 meters thick. They've been squashed down by Saturn. But out at the edges of the B ring here, you can see things that are the size of a kilometer, massive chunks of ice and rock. So we're able, just by being persistent, to determine some of the ring structure with the photography itself. This is one of my favorites as well, just because it's uh, the F ring, is this outer thin band. And it's a very tortured ring because it's got two little shepherd satellites that are constantly messing with it. And you can see one of them down there in the lower right, and you can see that little knot is pulled into it. There's a constant sense of turmoil in the F ring because as soon as it gets stable, either Pan or Pandora, or Prometheus or Pandora, come by and, and churn it up again. And then, this is kind of fun. Uh, a lot of times when we're taking pictures of the rings, you know, you'll see a moon or a satellite, some, some little photo bomb. But this one was particularly fun because if you look closely at that, that's not a moon, that's not a star, that is the Earth. Taken from a billion miles, a billion kilometers away. And if you look closely at the inset, you can see Earth's moon as well. So one of our uh, favorite family portraits, everybody's there. <laughs> And then Titan. Titan, from Voyager's point of view and from the Earth's point of view, was just a big fuzzy ball covered with essentially, you know, the equivalent of smog. I'm from Los Angeles and I can tell you all about that. Uh, we couldn't see through it, so one of Cassini's missions was to penetrate through that fog with the many instruments it carried and understand what was going on on the surface. The first thing we did was we landed the European Space Agency's probe onto the surface of Titan. And in a period of two and a half hours, we went from that to this. 
That is a picture from the surface of Titan by the European probe as it slowly para uh, uh, parachuted down through the atmosphere and imaged the, uh, the surface. That's a dry lake bed, believe it or not. Those rocks are not, well, they're rocks, but they're water ice. At 170, 180 degrees below zero centigrade, water is as hard as granite and has taken the place of, of the, the silicates that we expect here on Earth. But the liquid is now methane and ethane, simple hydrocarbons that freeze at much lower temperatures. And this was once a methane lake that has since dried up. Oh, and just for contrast, let me show you. That's a picture of the uh, Apollo astronaut's footprint, just to give you some idea of the size, size of those rocks. By the time we were done exploring Titan, 13 years later, we discovered Titan is an Earth-like world. It has rivers, it has lakes, and it has seas. Now, they're not water, they're ethane and methane, hydrocarbons. More hydrocarbons on Titan than there are over the entire Earth. If we could get a pipe up there, we'd be in great shape. <laughs> dunes, much like the uh, dunes in, equatorial, in the equatorial regions of the, United, uh, of, the, of the Earth. Mountains, clouds, and rain, an entire meteorological cycle. Those rivers are filled with rain, they fill the lakes, it evaporates, it goes on and on. And then finally, as I showed you, dry, well, dry riverbeds uh, that Huygens showed us. And then here's the biggest surprise from Saturn at all, Enceladus. The Enceladus of Voyager was a white snowball that we didn't quite understand. The Enceladus from Cassini was marvelously resolved by the images, but what was even more important, this little 300 kilometer, sorry, 500 kilometer snowball actually had geysers. A total surprise to everybody. Uh, it just seemed impossible that something that small could be active. But by the time we were done revectoring the mission to explore Enceladus, we had discovered that Enceladus was indeed, had an active jets and a subsurface ocean over the entire uh, moon. Three, 500 kilometers, barely big enough to pull itself together, and it had an ocean. The, the ocean was global, the water was salty, the, uh, long-lived, and there are hydrothermal vents. That water in the ocean is hot, and there's actually enough heat to almost boil it coming from Enceladus. And it's irrefutable. The ocean is a plenty of, high, of heat energy and even more compelling molecular hydrogen, an essential ingredient for life. And you've got organics in the plume coming from the ocean. So you've got heat, you've got salty water, you've got hydrogen, you have all the components for astrobiology. Now, no one's saying there's life at Enceladus, but this has turned us around about what Enceladus could possibly uh, be and where life could be. And there's a graphic uh, illustration of what, uh, what it might look like on the surface of Enceladus. So, that leaves us with the job of protecting Saturn's ocean worlds, which is why we decided to destroy a discovery machine. But not before we had done the grand finale. 22 orbits through this incredible gap. So I need to show you quickly what we meant by that. Let me just go you to a graphic. To a poet or an artist, Saturn is beautiful, and the rings are graceful. But to an engineer, both of them are hazards. If we got too close to the atmosphere, we would tumble out of control. If we got too close to the uh, rings, you can see at 120,000 kilometers per second, we had little chance of survival. So we had this very perilous course to try to stay through the gap, so to speak. And it was very important that we manage the trajectory carefully. So let me show you something really kind of fun here. What we decided to do was keep the antenna, the main dish of the spacecraft, pointing into the dust for the first travel through to see what happens. So listen to this. This is what we expected to hear. This is coming through the F-rings, right? That chart is actually, we're using the main antenna, and then as the particles hit it, we're turning those into sound. So you can actually hear the increase as the spacecraft travels through the, uh, the passageway. So this is what we expected. And if we got something like this, we'd be fine. We've done it plenty of times before, no big deal. So we did this uh, sort of thing with the uh, first passage through, and we got this. Uh, you can see from the picture, there is just nothing going on. We had to exaggerate it even to get any sound at all. So what turned out to be something of a great fear 
for the mission turned out instead to be a great surprise. We had nothing to worry about. So the spacecraft guys were all, you know, scientists have got a puzzle, they're happy. Where's the dust go? And we're happy because we've got no problems with going through the gap. And the atmosphere messed with us a little bit, but we, we figured that out as well. So here are just a few of the final photos in those final 22 orbits. The ring satellites, Pan, as you can see, get carving a gap in the rings. Atlas also car has carved a gap in the rings. And both of these have little mini skirts around them of ring material. They've actually about as big as they can get. Any bigger and Saturn will rip them apart. And then finally, this beautiful little moon, Daphnis, that's running around in the Keeler Gap. And you can see the waves of gravitational dispersions that is put on the rings. And let me give you a close-up of this, because it's just so fascinating. These little ripples dissipate after a little while, but they just follow Daphnis around as it channels around through the rings. And this is a family portrait. And I, a, fight, a flight team is just like an army. It runs on its stomach, so I couldn't stop them from doing this. <laughs> and they do look like pierogies, I must say. <laughs> the rings, incredible resolution of the rings, especially the straw-colored material to the left. And then another picture of the rings showing the entire internal history of the Saturn. Every time Saturn burps or gurgles, it's, it ripples the rings. And its entire history of Saturn is, is captured in time from the upper right, lower right to the upper left in this illustration. Finally, the last day. Saturn and its rings, Titan, Enceladus setting over Saturn, ice structures within the rings themselves, and we had discovered earlier a moon forming on the outer ring of Saturn, the outer A ring. The investigator named it Peggy uh, after his mother-in-law, and so he took one last picture of Peggy. Saturn approach. This is an image, again, an art, artistic rendering of the Saturn of Cassini on its final approach to Saturn. It had one last job to do, because if we were really going to keep all our promises, Cassini was now going to become an atmospheric probe. We were going to sample the atmosphere, something it had never been built to do, and return the data to Earth. So, we first turned the antenna towards the Earth. We turned on the instruments that could be useful at that time. We, uh, configured the spacecraft to play everything back, and then into the atmosphere we went. The whole strategy from then on was just hang on, stay pointed at the Earth as long as we possibly could to keep the data playing. The thrusters were fighting against loss of control. They were not, as you can see from this picture, this is not built for speed in the atmosphere. They were fighting and fighting and fighting against the incoming encroaching atmosphere. And for the very, very last second, Cassini was returning data. Finally, as you can see, the spacecraft vibrations became more and more uh, oppressed by the atmosphere, and it wasn't long before the thrusters gave up. We lost contact with the spacecraft. Shortly thereafter, we lost con uh, the spacecraft, destroyed. Became a part of the very planet it was sent to explore. Safely out of harm's way, it entered Saturn and was vaporized. This is, again, an artist's rendering of what we think was probably Cassini's last view as it went into Saturn. Fifteen years, I'm sorry, thirteen years of exploration, the spacecraft finally ended. But not before it had opened our eyes and revealed an incredible world. A world that has rewritten and rewritten again the text on planetary exploration and planet formation. It has made us rethink what we have to do, what we, what we think about astrobiology. And it just begs us to come back again. It's a tribute to the international effort and the might of the, uh, the world's people in getting this thing off the ground and, again, revealing the universe to us all. Ephistos. <laughs>